Uh, as always, let me begin by um, paying, acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we all respectively are present and acknowledging and celebrating and respecting uh, leaders past and present and emerging. <coughs> it's um, my very great pleasure to welcome to this session, Bob Einhorn, um, Senior Fellow at Brookings now, but a hugely distinguished diplomatic career behind him, as you've seen from his CV in the papers, as a senior State Department, or very senior State Department official in the non-proliferation arms control area during both, in particular, the Clinton and Obama administrations. As you might have noticed, we were going to be joined in this session by Amanda Gawley, who is the Australian Ambassador for Arms Control and Counterproliferation. Uh, but Amanda was given uh, just a couple of weeks ago a special assignment in circumstances we can probably imagine, which made it impossible for her to, uh, to join us. But I think we have um, so many other um, distinguished high-level members of the DFAT and defence establishments, uh, both present and former, that even though I can't be relied upon, I can't be trusted to give any kind of um, sympathetic view to the present government's position, no doubt uh, someone will fill the gap if I, uh, if I misspeak. Um, let me begin uh, in terms of the conduct of this session. Uh, there's a lot of ground we want to cover. Um, so Bob and I will have a conversation uh, covering eight or nine different topics over the next half hour or so, hopefully not much longer, uh, before we go to general discussion and, and Q&A. In which context, um, I think if we could work on the basis of just raising your hand physically or pressing the, uh, the raise hand button, uh, to get into the uh, discussion uh, that would work better than relying on me to follow a chat box. So um, I don't have a 10 year old to manage the, the history, so let's just do it uh, physically as we can. So look, in our opening um, panel conversation, Bob and I assume, uh, will assume, no doubt a little heroically, uh, that you've at least had a glance at the framing paper uh, that was circulated a few days ago. And in our conversation, we'll take as given that, um, although participants should, of course, feel questioned to feel able to challenge any of these assumptions, we'll take as a given the of nuclear weapons. We'll take as given um, the high likelihood, at least unintended, if not deliberate, in the foreseeable future. Uh, we'll take as given the enormous existential risk associated with any significant nuclear exchange. And I think we'll take as given also the self-evident um, sense of the Reagan-Gorbachev statement, now actually recently embraced by all of uh, Biden, Putin and Xi, that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. So taking all that as more or less given, our focus here will be on what, if anything, can be actually done to ensure that nuclear weapons are never used. We'll be looking at the, uh, the state of play, the prospects for nuclear stockpile reduction. Uh, we'll be an elimination. We'll be looking at um, holding the line on non-proliferation, and we'll be looking at more general risk reduction issues. I want to start with the existing nine uh, nuclear armed states and then moving from there later in the discussion to potential newcomers. So my, my first question, Bob, to get things started is, <coughs> basically, is the framing paper too pessimistic? The framing paper um, describes the, the prospects for significant movement towards disarmament as desolate. Uh, increasing, modernizing, their stockpiles, their arsenals, with missile systems developed, with no sign anywhere, reliance on nuclear weapons in national postures, with long US Russia, all arrangements ending and with no buy-in at all from anyone who matters to the nuclear ban treaty. Uh, that's the picture that's painted in the framing paper. Is it too pessimistic? Beginning in particular with the US-Russia um, relationship, given the possible ground for optimism, I guess, and I'd like you to talk about this, the Biden-Putin summit agreement to re-establish um, strategic security dialogue. 
to lay the groundwork for future arms control and risk reduction, as they say. Is there any hope at all for further bilateral stockpile reductions of the kind that we saw after the end of the Cold War? Bob. Uh, Gara, thank you very much for that introduction. And I thank uh, the organizers of the Crawford Leadership Forum for inviting me. Um, Gareth, for reasons that you uh, just mentioned, and also for additional reasons that you put in your framing paper, uh, there are plenty of grounds uh, for pessimism in the current uh, environment. Uh, but that doesn't mean that arms control is dead. It means that the focus of arms control needs to shift, at least in the near term, formal agreements to further reduce nuclear weapons are very unlikely in my view. Uh, it's a good thing uh, that the New Star Treaty was extended for five years and a good thing uh, that the United States and Russia have agreed to uh, resume strategic stability talks on a bilateral basis. But the main purpose of those bilateral talks uh, will be largely conceptual uh, to uh, reconceptualize strategic stability and arms control, to consider uh, how stability and future arms control will be affected by great power competition, uh, by disruptive uh, technologies uh, such as cyber and, hy and, uh, uh, and, and hypersonics, uh, by novel, by novel uh, nuclear weapons uh, uh, systems like uh, uh, undersea uh, drones, and also by additional nuclear competitors, uh, primarily China uh, and North Korea. So we can't really expect any near-term uh, disarmament agreements emerging from these uh, new uh, and resumed uh, bilateral US-Russian stability talks. The priority now, uh, when the prospect of nuclear conflict is greater now than it's been for decades, really, uh, should not be on further nuclear reductions. Uh, it should be reducing the likelihood that nuclear weapons will ever be used again. And that means pursuing uh, confidence building, transparency, uh, communications measures uh, that are uh, designed to reduce the likelihood of armed conflict resulting from accident uh, or miscalculation. It means uh, uh, developing uh, informal rules, rules of the road uh, to uh, create uh, 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 norms of responsible behavior in such areas as, uh, as space uh, and, uh, and, and cyber. And because uh, in my view, uh, any use of nuclear weapons today will almost surely uh, be the result of escalation from a regional conventional military conflict. It means focusing heavily on preventing regional armed conflicts from erupting in the first place, uh, whether along the NATO-Russia border, uh, the South China Sea or Taiwan Strait, uh, the Korean Peninsula or Kashmir. Eventually, uh, further nuclear reductions may be possible. Uh, but for now, the international arms control agenda will consist uh, of these uh, more modest uh, risk reduction measures. Well, I want to come back to risk reduction measures and perhaps some slightly less modest options in that area as well in a few moments. But let's uh, first of all explore some of the other key players and in particular China because uh, even more eyes are on China these days than the, than the big two, I guess. Uh, although its arsenal is only presently about one fifteenth on most estimates, um, the US size, and even though China has traditionally adopted a both a no first use and a minimal deterrence uh, posture, what is your take on the risks um, associated with the current Chinese enterprise of modernization, expansion, diversification, not least the recent information that's emerged about um, these missile silo sites um, in Western China, maybe up to 300, even though that doesn't necessarily mean 300 weapons. It could be a, could be a shell game. What's your take on the, the current risks associated with China's posture and whether it will ever be possible uh, to get China directly engaged in arms control, arms limitation arrangements? Uh, well, you know, in my view, Gareth, and not just in my view, it's almost uh, a consensus view now, uh, China's current nuclear modernization uh, uh, efforts um, are disturbing, including what you just mentioned, this uh, evidence that they are uh, constructing two or three 
uh, new fields of ICBM silos that could house hundreds of multiple warhead missiles. And you know, for decades, as you mentioned, uh, China has pursued a minimum uh, deterrence capability, but now that appears to be changing. Uh, the goals of its uh, modernization program uh, remain unclear. At a minimum, in my view, it wants to uh, ensure a secure, reliable nuclear retaliatory capability to deter the United States from conducting a disarming uh, nuclear first strike. By itself, that's understandable and relatively benign. But it takes place uh, at a time when China is acting more assertively toward its neighbors and working hard to replace the United States as the dominant conventional military power in the Western Pacific. By achieving a mutual nuclear deterrence relationship with the United States, China may hope to gain a freer hand to pursue its regional objectives without fear of US nuclear coercion. China is therefore very unlikely to agree to anything that could impede its ability to achieve a mutual deterrent relationship with the United States. But at the same time, China wishes to avoid armed conflict resulting from accidents, misperceptions, or miscalculations. And so hopefully it will agree before too long to engage in a strategic stability dialogue with the United States. It's so far resisted uh, holding such a, a dialogue. And such a dialogue would allow uh, each side to, to gain a better understanding of the other side's strategic objectives and perhaps avoid, uh, uh, perhaps avoid worst case uh, planning and even an arms race. It could also allow them to develop confidence building and other measures to reduce the likelihood of inadvertent armed conflict. And conceivably, they could also agree on mutual limitations or rules of the road in areas where the United States and China have comparable capabilities, such as cyber, space, or hypersonics. Uh, but formal quantitative nuclear arms limitations agreements uh, are very unlikely for quite some time. How much serious commitment is there within the present Biden administration given domestic political imperatives and the and the extent of the emotion that now seems to be invested in the, the anti-China position? How much serious commitment is there to such a strategic dialogue as you describe it, even, a, even one with fairly modest aspirations? I think there's a real commitment to do that. Uh, the Biden administration has uh, emphasized that it, while uh, key, key uh, aspects of the relationship will be competitive, uh, it looks to cooperate uh, in areas where interests can uh, converge, whether it's climate change or dealing with North Korea, but certainly avoiding uh, inadvertent armed conflict is one of those converging interests. Well, let's keep moving across this rather broad landscape. Uh, next, uh, North Korea, in which you've been very closely involved for a very long time with almost every dimension of uh, US nuclear policy. Um, are prospects for a negotiated settlement uh, with Pyongyang now completely dead in the water? Do you see any hope at all for achieving denuclearization or even just a permanent freeze on North Korea's uh, nuclear capability? Uh, has the U.S. really gone as far as it could and arguably should go in putting incentives on the table for North Korea to move? Uh, Gareth, uh, at their uh, summit uh, in Singapore, Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump agreed to work toward the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. But nothing Kim Jong-un has said or done uh, since then suggests that he has any intention whatsoever of abandoning his nuclear deterrent, which I believe uh, he sees as essential to the survival of his regime. Uh, the North has continued a de facto moratorium on ICBM uh, uh, range uh, missile tests uh, and uh, nuclear weapons tests, but it's continued to increase uh, its strategic capabilities including by developing and testing short and medium range uh, missiles, uh, and also by producing uh, fissile materials to expand its arsenal of nuclear weapons. Uh, actually in the current uh, report by the IAEA, 
the, uh, the IEA states that after a lengthy hiatus, uh, North Korea has resumed the production of plutonium for uh, nuclear weapons. The Biden administration has repeatedly uh, reached out to North Korea uh, and called for no negotiations anywhere, uh, anytime. But the uh, North has repeatedly uh, refused to engage. Uh, I believe the Biden administration is realistic about what can be achieved with North Korea. It's reaffirmed uh, the ultimate goal of complete denuclearization, but it recognizes that at least for the foreseeable future, that goal is not in the cards. And so it's prepared to pursue denuclearization, uh, but as a long-term step-by-step -step process that would begin with near-term limits on North Korea's nuclear and missile capabilities. Further steps toward denuclearization would be deferred uh, for until a future time. But Pyongyang uh, hasn't budged. Uh, perhaps it's ruled out engagement as long as it remains sealed off from the world due to the uh, COVID uh, uh, pandemic. Perhaps it's waiting for uh, unilateral concessions by the Biden administration, or perhaps after the failed Hanoi summit with Trump, uh, it sees little prospect of an agreement that would serve North Korea's interests. Uh, whatever the, what's that? Sorry. So I'll let you finish, but what, what is the downside risk in the US coming forward with something that is a credible unilateral concession, even if only something to do with the status of the war issue, the guarantee of diplomatic uh, relationship or, or something of that kind, uh, you know, which, which Korea is obviously wanting. The US position has not been to put anything on the table before sitting down, but maybe we need a circuit breaker. Well, you know, uh, the U.S. ambassador uh, and envoy Sung Kim was in Seoul uh, recently, uh, and apparently the uh, two allies talked about uh, humanitarian assistance to the North, especially during the COVID crisis, uh, that could help jumpstart uh, engagement between the U.S. and uh, North Korea. Uh, but I think we'll have to wait and see uh, whether the uh, the North has an appetite for beginning uh, for beginning discussions. I am, yeah, I, I think eventually it will. It's an economic crisis. Uh, I the, I think the Biden administration is dead set against making major unilateral concessions other than humanitarian assistance to get talks started. I think uh, it's uh, the Biden administration is already already pursuing a domestically uh, risky uh, engagement with Iran. Uh, and it knows that the prospects for productive engagement with North Korea e are even lower. Uh, and so I think it's reluctant to undertake uh, more unilateral steps to get talks started. Well, we have to wait and see. Well, no doubt a number of our participants will want to come back to North Korea and in fact, all these issues so far. But just one more quickly on North Korea. How seriously do you place the risk of aggressive first use by North Korea of such weapons as it has? Do you, do you count that as a risk factor at all or, or discount well, it? Well, you know, Kim Jong-un has, has talked about initiating the use of nuclear weapons. Um, I, you know, I don't think he's serious about it. Uh, I know, uh, he, he must know that that would mean the annihilation of his regime. Uh, which is something, which is a fate he doesn't want. So uh, I, 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 I doubt these threats are serious. Okay, let's pick up the pieces briefly um, with the other nuclear armed states, India, Pakistan, um, Israel, inc you know, including the, the NPT non-members. What's the prospects, if any, of bringing them into serious nuclear arms control? Uh, negotiations, whether bilateral or multilateral, and even if the prospect of um, stockpile reduction in those cases is, is zero in the present environment, what about the possibility for some serious, not just confidence building, but some more serious uh, risk reduction measures like, you know, reduced deployments, de-alerting, and no first use, which we'll no doubt come back to. Is any of that yeah. stuff on the you be able to close? Well, you know, I think there may be some value in trying to bring NPT nuclear weapon states and, uh, you know, non-NPT uh, nuclear armed states uh, together for consultations. Uh, I'm only talking, by the way, about seven nuclear powers. I'm not talking about 
Israel, which is not going to play, it doesn't acknowledge having nuclear weapons. I'm not talking about North Korea. Uh, we don't want to invite uh, North Korea to a table with nuclear uh, armed states. Um, the, you know, the seven nuclear powers, if you could get them together, might discuss some common challenges, like the challenges, the challenge of securing uh, its uh, nuclear uh, weapons, installations, materials against theft or seizure. Uh, they might uh, also share uh, experiences, their own experiences with previous confidence building measures uh, and compare notes on what has worked. But developing new uh, risk reduction measures is more likely to be feasible, I think, in a bilateral or regional context, such as along the NATO-Russia border or the South China Sea. Uh, I'm, I've, I've, I've read about your four Ds, uh, Gareth, and I'm not terribly optimistic about uh, anyone, any of them, whether it's decreasing the number of nuclear weapons in total inventories, uh, decreasing the number of deployed um, uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, what you have now is you know, US and Russia, I don't believe are gonna uh, reduce their deployments. Uh, the UK, as you pointed out in your framing paper, has even increased the ceiling on its deployed uh, weapons. Uh, and uh, China, North Korea, India, and Pakistan are increasing their deploy deployments. De-alerting is your third D. I, I don't see it. I see United States and, and uh, Russia uh, retaining uh, their highly alert uh, prompt law launch uh, force postures. Uh, and China, uh, uh, Pakistan, and India once kept their nuclear warheads unmated uh, from delivery systems, but now it looks like they're moving in the other direction. So the third D, um, not, not very optimistic. Your fourth on doctrine uh, and prospects for uh, universal buy-in to no first use, um, I'm dubious on that uh, as well. Uh, even for China and India, which have had no first use postures, but may be moving away from them. But you probably want to talk more about the US approach on no first use. We'll come back to that in just one second. But if the weapon states are going to dig their heels in on any significant movement on any of these really major risk reduction issues, what on earth can they bring to the table in an NPT conference context? Uh, that will begin to satisfy the perception of the non-nuclear weapon states, that the, uh, the weapon states are simply not serious about disarmament. They can talk their heads off about transparency and Australia can talk its head off about, uh, you know, all the wonderful things we're doing to contribute to uh, you know, energizing the nuclear weapon states to bring something to the table. But in the absence of any of that bigger stuff, I mean, is any of this remotely credible? Well, look, um... What can the nuclear weapon states bring to the table? Uh, I think many of the NPT non-nuclear weapon states understand that the current strategic environment is not very auspicious for, uh, for arms control, especially uh, for nuclear further nuclear reductions. And I think they recognize the need to pursue risk reduction measures that can reduce the likelihood of nuclear war. Um, will they ever be satisfied? No, uh, they will never be satisfied, nor, nor, nor should they. Uh, the record of nuclear weapon states in implementing, the NPT nuclear weapon states in implementing their Article 6 uh, commitments is, is, is not very good. Um, and this is going to lead, I think, to more contention uh, at the upcoming uh, review conference. Uh, but, uh, you know, my own view uh, is, um, and you've, you've raised questions about this se uh, separately, my own view is it's not going to lead to additional countries deciding to have nuclear weapons. Um, you know, countries don't decide to have nuclear weapons because of the slow pace of disarmament. They decide for their own particular reasons because their security is jeopardized, because they want more uh, status and influence and prestige, uh, because there are domestic pressures to get nuclear or the rest. Uh, it's not because of the slow pace of nuclear disarmament. Well, we'll come back to one of the key proliferation potential states, Iran, uh, in just a moment. But let's, let's go back to the no first use issue, which is the subject of a major international campaign at the moment and is probably you know, 
the risk reduction measure with the, one of the four Ds with the most apparent likelihood of some buy-in around the place. The nuclear umbrella states, Australia included, have played a really fairly crucial role in the past in inhibiting any move by the US down this particular track. President Obama, as we know, wanted to go the no, at least the sole purpose route, which is the functional equivalent of no first use, but was dissuaded eventually by the by the Northeast Asian allies, by the Central and East European allies, and with a bit of help from Australia as well, uh, not to do that. What, what are the prospects and what's the desirability of a no first use or at least a sole purpose commitment? And what are the prospects of the US moving in that direction? What will it take to, to get it there? Well, I'm not going to make you happy with this answer, uh, Gareth. Uh, in, in January 2017, in his last month as vice president, uh, Biden expressed his personal view uh, that the sole purpose of US nuclear weapons should be deter and if necessary respond uh, to nuclear attack against the US or its allies. Biden repeated that position as a candidate uh, for the presidency. Uh, but now his administration is conducting its nuclear uh, posture review and I doubt uh, that it will adopt a sole purpose, sole purpose as an official U.S. policy. Now, a key argument <laughs> for sole purpose, uh, or NFU, as you point out, it, it, is its equivalent, is that U.S. adversaries no longer believing the U.S. will use nuclear weapons first in a crisis will have less incentive uh, to use nuclear weapons first themselves. Uh, but as long as the United States uh, maintains a prompt launch force posture, U.S. adversaries will place, will place very little faith in a U.S. NFU pledge, uh, and their incentives to preempt with nuclear weapons won't be reduced. So I think yeah, a, a critical argument for no first youth, I, I think, is seriously uh, questioned. Um, and the Achilles heel of no first use, and you've alluded to, to this, is that it could undermine the confidence of US allies in the US ability to deter major non-nuclear threats. NATO allies in Eastern Europe, and in particular Japan, uh, among US Asian allies, remain opposed to no first use, especially as threats from Russia, China, and North Korea have increased. And given the Biden administration's strong commitment to reinforcing the credibility of US security assurances to allies, I think a sole purpose declaration uh, is very unlikely, despite what, me, my, what might be the president's personal preference. Now, this is especially the case uh, in light of the strategic and political fallout from the US withdrawal from Afghanistan. But I think there's much that the Biden administration can do short of declaring no first use to indicate that the use of nuclear weapons should only be considered in the most extreme of circumstances. In particular, it can reverse the Trump administration's apparent expansion of those circumstances. The Trump uh, nuclear posture review explicitly reserved the right to use nuclear weapons in response to conventional military attack against civilian populations or infrastructure, or in response to a cyber attack against critical infrastructure, early warning systems, or nuclear command and control systems. But the United States has effective and more proportionate and credible non-nuclear means for deterring and responding to such attacks. A nuclear response is simply not necessary. In addition, the Biden administration, like the Obama administration, but unlike the Trump administration, should explicitly adopt sole purpose as a goal and should commit to putting in place conditions that would allow that goal to be realized. It should give substance to that commitment by establishing dedicated consultative mechanisms with allies with the express purpose of identifying and promoting those conditions and evaluating periodically progress toward putting them in place. To be sure, it's a modest step that would disappoint advocates of no first use, but it's a step at least in the right direction, unlike the direction in which we've been headed in recent years.
Well, Bob, you've directly acknowledged that it is what we call in Australia bullshit to suggest that the United States would ever use first nuclear weapons in response to a sub-nuclear attack, whether it's cyber or hypersonic or anything else. It just won't. We know that it's got sufficient conventional capability for the foreseeable future to retaliate in any conceivable way uh, to such an attack. It's not going to do it. So why the hell not have people like you? Because, look, frankly, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If people like you, with your experience and your credibility, are not prepared to go and say, this is something we should do, it's not going to happen. Look, you're absolutely right in saying that without being backed by reduced numbers, reduced deployment, de-alerting and so on, no first use does remain a statement rather than something that has a huge amount of, of credibility in extremists. But, um, but is this something we, we should give up on? There's, there's so little on the table at the moment that this at least looks like something that would take us a credible step forward. You know, uh, once I was at a, uh, a senior meeting, it was in the Situation Room, and we were talking about these issues. I was, it was in the context of the 2010 Nuclear Posture Review. And kind of before the meeting began, I went to a very senior uh, US military officer. And I said, sir, uh, would the US president ever uh, authorize nuclear weapons against a non-nuclear attack? Would he actually do that? Uh, at the time I said he or she, we were already thinking of a possible she, but uh, in any event, so I asked him, he said, no, uh, the US president would not use nuclear weapons against a non-nuclear attack. But he added, but our adversaries don't know that. Uh, and that's the critical thing from, uh, from the, the perspective of the US nuclear establishment. Well, this is no doubt an issue we'll pick up in discussion, which I want to get to very shortly, but just two other issues, first of all. Uh, one is you've touched upon it, but it is pretty critical. A new technological development, space, cyberspace, hypersonics, drones. To what extent has that seriously complicated the prospect for any kind of arms control negotiation of the kind that we've been canvassing? Um, governments, as you point out, have only recently begun to conceptualize how to cope with potentially disruptive technologies like cyber, counter space, hypersonics, and so forth. These technologies pose serious potential threats to early warning and command and control systems, and they could reduce decision time in a crisis. Now, these challenges need to be addressed somehow in future arms control discussions. It's no longer enough to deal with the threats to strategic stability posed by nuclear weapons themselves, but adding new technologies to the mix will clearly complicate arms control negotiations. Because these difficulties are, are uh, evolving so rapidly and because of the of difficulties of definition, verification and attribution, especially for cyber, it will be hard to deal with them using traditional arms control methods. Some, uh, especially cyber, will need to be addressed in separate informal arrangements like normative rules of the road rather than formal legally binding agreements. And it's a, and here's an important point I want to make. It's, you need to recognize, one needs to recognize uh, that arms control by itself can't eliminate the threats posed by these new technologies. In fact, the most effective means of protecting against these threats will be unilateral. For example, taking unilateral steps to make early warning and command and control systems more resilient and more redundant. Iran is something you've been directly personally engaged with that issue right really from the outset. What are the prospects now of getting the JCPOA back on any kind of track? Will Iran's advances in fissile material production, given the, uh, the Trump horror story, uh, mean that um, the restoration of the agreement is not going to make much practical difference? Uh, is an agreement that doesn't address missile delivery systems and um, Iran's actions in the region still an agreement worth having. What's your quick take on that? We'll have to we'll have to leave some time for discussion. So I just want you to open up the issue. Yeah, you know, I look. Um, 
restorate, you know, the Biden administration in a two-step plan, restore JCPOA and use it as a starting point for following negotiations on a broader deal that would strengthen the JCPOA and deal with the regional and missile uh, threats. Uh, the restoration was supposed to be the easy part. Well, they began these in indirect contacts uh, in Vienna, but they bogged down. Um, I think the, uh, the Iranians have overreached uh, we can go into some examples of that, but I think they've they've overreached in their negotiating positions. Uh, and you now have a new hardline government in Tehran, uh, President Ibrahim Raisi. Um, he wants to resume negotiations. He recognizes Iran is in dire economic straits, uh, and it needs the removal of the sanctions uh, through restoration of the JCPOA to get the economy back on track. But I don't think he's going to soften their negotiating position. Uh, the Biden administration believes it's um, it, it's it's done more to reach uh, to to meet Iran halfway uh, and doesn't want to make any unilateral more additional unilateral concessions. Uh, and it says that um, uh, negotiations can't go on indefinitely with the continued improvement um, uh, of Iran's nuclear capabilities, the, the experience, knowledge they're gaining from advanced centrifuge operation. Uh, it's going to be hard to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. It's going to be hard uh, to, uh, to restore the JCPOA uh, and reestablish the long breakout time than the, that the JCPOA guaranteed. So I don't know. It's hard to tell now uh, whether agreement can be reached sometime this fall. If it's not reached um, and there is no restoration, what the Biden administration may do is to try to skip the restoration of the JCPOA and go directly uh, to these follow-on negotiations, these expanded negotiations that would also deal with the regional missile threats as well. Uh, but if they've had so much difficulty restoring the JCPOA, uh, I wouldn't put uh, you know, a, bi a big bet on being able to succeed in the more complicated negotiation. Well, plenty more to discuss there. Look, just one last question, which I would have been putting to Amanda Gawley had she been with us, but I'd really like your take on it. What role, if any, can middle powers like Australia play in this whole nuclear arms control enterprise? We have played some kind of a role in the past in developing normative uh, positions with the Canberra Commission and so on that's spilt out in the framing paper. Is there any prospect of us playing a useful role in the future in moving this agenda forward? Should we be minded to? Um, over the years, and you point this out in your framing paper, Gareth, uh, or Australia has indeed punched way above its weight in these arms, uh, in these international arms control discussions, uh, and you've played uh, personally uh, a major role uh, in in that uh, arena. Uh, you also point out that Australia has been a key participant in organizations like the NPDI, and they have helped uh, pursue a constructive middle ground. Uh, between the NPT nuclear weapon states and some of the more strident uh, non-aligned states. And this is sometimes facilitated consensus at NPT review conferences and maybe minimize some of the polarization that has plagued the non-proliferation regime. But in terms of impact, uh, I think uh, Australia's most uh, impactful role uh, can be as a trusted ally of the United States. Uh, its views are taken seriously in Washington, both in bilateral contacts, and there are many of those, uh, as well as meetings of uh, like-minded countries like, like the Quad. Richard. Yeah, thanks, Gareth, and thanks, um, thanks Rob. Um, you know, I, I can't speak for the government anymore, as you know, uh, but, I, but I do wonder about your question about middle power contribution, uh, because I think that's waning a bit from an Australian perspective. And I think, I think there are probably uh, three reasons for that. One is the exceptionally difficult environment that you both have been talking about and the sense of real progress on uh, nuclear arms reduction. Uh, it's just not possible at the moment because of the very tense competitive environment between a uh, number of the nuclear weapon states, uncertain regional 
situations and so on. The second is China, which, of course, hangs heavy over all of the Australian foreign policy debate at the moment and a feeling in the system that the alliance uh, and the nuclear umbrella that comes with it is more important than ever. Third reason is I don't think we've had a, uh, a minister in recent times with the same personal passion uh, that you brought to the uh, issue, Gareth, and I think that shows. But I would say that I do think that's still embedded in the Australian system, certainly uh, in the um, International Security Division in the department uh, and across um, other parts of the Australian system like um, ASNO, there still is uh, quite a deep repository of expertise in this idea that Australia uh, can play an important role to push things along. We've seen that most recently, I think, with... Rob Floyd uh, being elected as the uh, head of the CTP, uh, CTPO. Uh, and that continues a long tradition of Australian officials serving in senior positions uh, in international uh, organisations dedicated to arms control uh, and disarmament. And um, Australian diplomats still plugging away at things like um, uh, technical questions on verification of nuclear disarmament uh, and on the NPDI initiative to support the NPT, which has been hit a bit by COVID, hasn't been able to meet uh, in person. Um, so I do still think there is a role personally for Australia uh, on middle powers, uh, including uh, encouraging the US system uh, on in the negotiations in Iran there was a, a bit of a wobble over the Iran deal a few years ago under the Trump administration, but ultimately the Australian government came down and said the deal uh, was worth staying in, uh, even though the Trump administration didn't listen to us. Uh, I think that's a valuable role we can keep playing. And certainly on North Korea, uh, where we have a prominent role in sanctions enforcement. Uh, and also, I think, in talking to the American system about um, options there, including, I think, forestalling preemptive military action, which in most circumstances the Australian system continues to believe would be highly risky and counterproductive. So I suppose there are a few thoughts about um, where Australia is. Richard, thanks very much for that. More specifically, on just on the no first use sole purpose issue, that is something presumably the Biden administration is going to seek allied input on. What should our advice specifically be to Washington if and when asked on that, or frankly, even if not asked? Should we be as cautious as Bob is suggesting we should be on this, or is it something on which um, a little bit of heroism might be overdue? Um, look, I, uh, well, again, I can't speak for the government here. I, I think we will be reading the tea leaves pretty closely in Washington, and I think there'll be low appetite for uh, suggesting uh, a course of action to the Biden administration that we know that they're not going to take. That's my, that's my guess. Well, again, self-fulfilling prophecy stuff. I mean, Biden's not going to take it if he doesn't get any signals from allies like us that this is a legitimate cause. If we all hide under the table, I mean, obviously, um, lowest common denominator, risk avoidance, political risk avoidance is going to prevail. I weep a little. Bob, do you have any comment on any of that? <laughs> um, just one last question from me, because the Crawford Forum does engage not only... Uh, business and public sector people, but the civil society, non-government organisations as well. And Australian non-government organisations have really been pretty prominent in the whole nuclear debate for a very long time. But is anyone listening anymore to anything that comes from below? Is this um, necessarily, this whole nuclear arms control business, is it necessarily a top-down business? Uh, or is there potential for important bottom-up contributions? Just one more dimension I'd like to get on the table before we break. Yeah. You know, when, when I was uh, a government official, uh, and I was a government official for many years, um, you know, I, I listened politely to uh, NGOs, um, but, um, you know, frankly, I was a bit too dismissive, in part because I didn't feel they had access to the sensitive information I had access to. Uh, but now things have really changed. Uh, with, uh, you know, open source uh, information so uh, prevalent on so many issues, with commercial uh, photography, a very high resolution 
uh, you have these uh, uh, non-governmental organizations in a, pl in a position uh, to, to play important roles. And you have these think tanks and organizations like, like your, you participate in Gareth uh, with a very deep expertise, uh, including uh, former government officials uh, who know, uh, who remember how the sausage was made uh, and who have a real appreciation of, of decision-making and policy-making. And I think increasingly, uh, they're going to play a big role, especially at a time when people don't have the answers, uh, when, uh, uh, you know, a reconceptualization of deterrence and stability and arms control would be uh, necessary. I don't think governments have a comparative advantage uh, in, uh, in that. Well, that's at least a marginally more optimistic note on which to conclude after this sea of pessimistic desolation, which we've been experiencing over the last hour. But uh, we've been experiencing it with the help of uh, some hugely interesting input from you, Bob, and hugely expert and experienced input. And we really, really appreciate your participation. I'd like to express my appreciation to all the other uh, participants in this enterprise and bid uh, the conference organizers, Richard, Pam, all the rest of you, um, a very productive conference for the rest of the, uh, the two days. So thanks, Bob. Thanks, everyone. And we'll now leave you to move on. Great.